Okay, so welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In today's video, we're going to be going through our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. We're going to be bringing in this long-run aggregate supply curve, and then from that, we can begin to talking about our business cycle and our adjustments and our readjustment back to long-run equilibrium. This here builds upon our last two videos. So at the start, we built up our aggregate demand model from our Keynesian cross. That's going back a few weeks even of material that was necessary to build that up. The last video was on our aggregate supply, which we were able to construct relatively rapidly. In this one here, we bring it all together and we go a step farther to take a look at the business cycle and that long run aggregate supply. So let's start off by talking about this idea of our long run aggregate supply, and then we'll move from there. Okay, so we've taken a look at our aggregate demand aggregate supply model already. You'll recall this as the example we finished off with last time. So here we had an aggregate supply curve, we had an aggregate demand curve, and we took a look at a massive forest fire crippling our nation's manufacturing, and we worked that through as a negative supply shock. <clears throat> what we're gonna have to keep in mind is that when we're talking about aggregate supply, aggregate demand in this sense, what these actually are is our short run aggregate supply, and similarly our short run aggregate demand. That is in the now, in the present, what they currently are given current market forces on them. But what we also have is a long run aggregate supply. And the idea behind our long run aggregate supply, so LRAS, long run aggregate supply, is that the amount of output that we're able to produce in the long run right, the amount of stuff that we could produce in this state here is known as our potential GDP. Now, potential GDP, this is actually a term that we've looked at already, a term we've already discussed, but it's been a while. So let's, let's go back and talk about what exactly we mean by potential GDP. So what we mean by potential GDP is it's an idea, that is we can't actually go out and measure it or witness it in the wild. It's an idea, it's a construct, but essentially it's saying, hey, this is how much output we could make, uh, it would help if I could spell, we could produce if we had full employment. Okay. Now again, full employment is another term that we need to define, right? Full employment does not necessarily mean everybody in the economy is working. What full employment means is that the only unemployment is our natural rate of unemployment. So that is Hey, if we had natural rate of unemployment, we would refer to that as, I will refer to that at least, as U star, a natural rate of unemployment. Keeping in mind this natural rate is just our structural and our frictional unemployment. And potential GDP then, we'll refer to that as, well, GDP we've been referring to as Y. So potential GDP, I'll be referring to that as Y star. And what we end up finding, we've already talked about this. This isn't actually a new concept. We're just now bringing it into the focus of our new model. We said that, hey, when actual output, so that's gonna be our equilibrium level of output, equals, our potential, so hey, the amount of stuff we actually make being one and the same as our potential, well then our actual rate of unemployment is gonna be one and the same as our natural rate of unemployment. Well, okay, we could have other things going on. We could have, hey, like that case we just had, we could have a drop in our actual GDP, our actual equilibrium, short run equilibrium level of GDP. So that would be a case like this, such that, hey, our actual GDP is less than our potential GDP. Well, if that happens, then keeping in mind what's going on, we're producing less stuff. 
If we're producing less stuff, well, we need less people. If we need less people, we're going to have more unemployment. So that is unemployment is going to become greater than our natural rate of unemployment. In this kind of case here, when output is less than potential and unemployment is above the natural, we would say that we are experiencing a recessionary output gap. The flip side of that is our inflationary output gaps, which occur when output is above potential output, and thus our unemployment, right? Okay, we're producing more stuff than we would at full employment. How do we make more stuff? Well, we make more stuff by employing more people. So employing more people drives that unemployment rate down, so our unemployment rate would be lower than our natural rate of unemployment. And again, how is our unemployment rate lower than our natural rate of unemployment? Well, we begin to eat into this frictional and this structural unemployment, right? Frictional unemployment is, hey, ah, you're not necessarily the best fit for us, but you're breathing. Here you go. Here's a job. So we're going to eat into this frictional unemployment a little bit. Structural unemployment, ah, you don't quite have the skills yet that you need for this job, but we're desperate for workers, so we'll train you and we'll teach you those skills on the go, right? So <clears throat> you're eating into a bit of this natural unemployment, but there's such a demand for output, there's such a desire to produce more and more stuff that, hey, there's a huge demand for workers in order to produce this stuff, so ah, some, work, some people, some firms are willing to overlook those facts. In our previous case, with a recessionary output, well, the, sorry, recessionary output gap, we have this higher rate of unemployment. Where does that show up? Well, it doesn't show up in structural. It doesn't show up in frictional. These would just be at their natural rate. This excess unemployment, this excess unemployment, we call this our cyclical unemployment rate. And that is it changes right in cycle with the economy. If GDP is high, cyclical unemployment is low. If GDP drops, well, then cyclical unemployment rises. Okay, so how exactly does this all fit into our model with our aggregate demand and our aggregate supply? Well, let's go take a look at that next. So let's draw our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, and let's talk about it and bring in our long run aggregate supply. So we have our vertical, which is our price level. We have our horizontal, which is our real output. And let's start off by putting in our long run aggregate supply here. Keeping in mind what our long run aggregate supply is, is just our potential GDP. That is the idea of how much we could produce. If we had full employment, every, all of our resources, all of our factors of production were fully utilized, we only had that natural unemployment. Well, keep in mind that that really doesn't depend on the prices, right? The natural rate of unemployment is frictional and structural. Those don't depend on the price of goods and services. Those depend on skills and whether or not you're the right fit for the right job. So what we get for this is some level of output such that it's completely independent from prices. What does that look like? Well, that looks something like, oh, let's use the right tool. That was rather anticlimactic in the end. That looks something like this, a vertical line. We get our long run aggregate supply curve. Vertical line such that at the bottom here, this is just saying, hey, this is our potential output irrespective of price level, right? Doesn't matter what prices are doing, this is how much stuff we could produce if we were fully employing all of our factors of employment, all of our factors of output rather. So if all of our pro productive factors were employed, this is the amount of stuff we could produce. We then have our short run aggregate demand curve. There we go. And we have our short run aggregate supply curve. And I'm going to draw these such that to start off at least, we are jointly in a short run and a long run equilibrium. That is at this point here, 
we have y prime, y prime being our actual GDP as determined by aggregate demand equals aggregate supply. We have that short run GDP equal to potential GDP. And I just see I messed up there. I was talking and I wrote down what I was saying. I wrote short run here, SR, that guy there, that is our aggregate supply. So we have to start off here. In the short one, uh, let's go like this. Aggregate demand equals aggregate supply. This yields for us our equilibrium level of real GDP and our price level. And so let's update that. We also have our price level. There we go, of 100. So, okay, in the short run, aggregate demand equals aggregate supply. That gives us our short run macroeconomic equilibrium, determining our actual GDP as we observe it. So when Statistics Canada says, hey, the current value of GDP is reported as X, well, that has been reported by that equilibrium of aggregate supply, aggregate demand. When they say, hey, our current price level, our current value of CPI is X, well, that's as determined as our price level through where our aggregate demand, aggregate supply are. In the long run, we have a long run equilibrium, which occurs when, and here we can change colors for this, our long run equilibrium occurs where the long run aggregate supply equals aggregate demand equals aggregate supply. That's where all three of these curves intersect. That is right now at that point. And at this point here, we get equilibrium level of GDP equal to potential GDP. So that is, hey, in our long run, we would always expect output to equal potential output, GDP to equal potential GDP. That is, hey, at this point here, we would expect our actual rate of unemployment to be equal to our natural rate of unemployment. Okay. In the short run, though, in the short run, this doesn't necessarily have to be true. In the short run, we can have shocks to our aggregate demand curve. We can have shocks to our aggregate supply curve such that we find that output is less than potential, such that output is above potential. And if output is above or below potential, then we're going to have inflationary or recessionary output gaps. And if we have these output gaps, we're similarly going to have impacts to our unemployment rates. So let's talk about why, right? We've already taken a look at why this is a short run equilibrium. Let's talk about why this is a long run equilibrium. And to do so, well, let's go and well, let's go take a look at the example that we already took a look at that we started this off with. And that is we had this negative aggregate supply shock due to that, I believe we said a forest fire. And then because of that forest fire, we had something like this. And we can change that. Let's say that that price level was 105. And giving us a short run, short run macroeconomic equilibrium right there, such that, hey, we had our Y prime. So, okay, and again, you're like, wait, what? Why did that aggregate supply curve shift? Well, what I'm just going off of is I'm saying, hey, let's suppose this happened. Massive forest fire cripples our nation's manufacturing, shifting our short run aggregate supply to the left. And right now we're finding ourselves at this less, that lower value of real output and this higher price level as a result assuming right big assumption here is that this initial one was such that y prime equals y star so we're just taking this example and we're overlaying our potential gdp on top of it giving us this okay so what happens we have this short run macroeconomic equilibrium right here are we just happy in the short run equilibrium just forever in a recessionary output gap right and wait why, why is this a recessionary output gap well we take a look we have y prime less than potential that is we're producing less stuff than could be produced if we had full employment 
hey, hey, if we're producing less stuff than it could be produced if we had full employment, that must mean we're hiring less people. That must mean that our unemployment is greater than our unemployment rate at the natural rate of unemployment, right? So we have a lot of people being unemployed. Okay, this is actually pretty key here. This is actually going to be the driving force as to how we end up back at our long-run equilibrium. And that is this excess unemployment. So, okay, all these people are unemployed. They don't want to be unemployed, right? They have bills to pay. They need to get food. They need to get clothing, all of this. They want work in order to be able to meet this. Now, we've said, okay, they're going to be looking for work. They're going to be saying, hey, please hire me. Please hire me. I want my job. I want a job. But initially, initially, right, okay, we have this high unemployment, so they're going to have a really hard time. And initially, they're going to be saying, please hire me. I was laid off at $25 an hour. I want to be hired back on at $25 an hour because in my mind, that's what I'm worth. But here's the problem, right? Now we've talked about this. This is our problem of sticky wages. Firms aren't going to be willing to hire people back at $25 an hour because, well, there's just not the demand for it, right? They're already at that place. They're already producing an equal short run equilibrium level of output such that, hey, the amount they're producing is equal to what's there. They're saying, well, why? Why should we hire you? We don't need you. Eventually, what happens is we kind of, you know, eat, swallow our pride, and we begin to say, please, please hire me. I'm willing to work for $20 an hour, right? We begin to push down our own wages. We begin to accept lower wages because end of the day, it's better to accept a lower wage than to go hungry. So we begin to accept these lower wages. As these wages begin to fall, hey, 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 wait, wait a minute. What do we say? We said falling wages. Hey, what is that? That's a falling factor price. What is factor price is part of, right? Wages are a factor. Well, labor is a factor of production. Wages are the price of labor. So, hey, if we have falling factor prices, that's, that's part of our aggregate supply curve. So what we witness is this high rate of unemployment puts this downward pressure on our wages eventually due to sticky wages. These falling wages are falling factor prices, meaning all else constant, I'm now able to produce more because, hey, I can now hire these new workers at a lower wage, dropping my average wage altogether. As that happens, the aggregate supply curve begins to shift little bit to the left. But okay, you see, we're not quite back at our level there, right? We have a little bit more output, a little bit lower price level, but we're not back at our long run equilibrium. That is, we are still in a recessionary output gap. We still have high unemployment. So wages continue to have downward pressure. Wages continue to have downward pressure. And again, Aggregate supply shifts a little bit due to these falling wages, falling factor prices, meaning that I can produce more given this fixed price level. This continues, this continues, this continues, this downward pressure on wages, hiring more and more people, decreasing our cyclical unemployment, decreasing our whole unemployment until we wind up at, I uh, didn't quite line that up good. There we go. We line up, we arrive back at aggregate supply one. That is the falling factor prices shift our aggregate supply curve out to the right. This falling aggregate supply curve will continue to fall until it arrives back at this long run equilibrium. And the reason it will continue to move until we get to there is because at this long run equilibrium, we now have y prime equal to y star, and we now have unemployment equal to the natural rate of unemployment. With unemployment equal to the natural rate, there's no longer any downward pressure on wages. There's no longer all these people being like, I have the skills, I have the training, you're the perfect employer for me, please hire me. They're not saying no. They're saying, hey, yeah, I am the perfect employer for you, you're the perfect employee for me. Yep, we're good. Come work. There's no 
there's no cyclical unemployment. If you're unemployed and you have the skills and you found the right employer, there was the job for you, right? There's just that natural rate of unemployment remaining. The result of that is there's no more pressure on wages one way or another. And we find that we are now back at our long run equilibrium. Result of that is that prices have fallen relative to our shock and GDP has returned such that once again, the actual level of GDP equals our potential level of GDP. So we witnessed the recessionary output gap and how the economy would naturally close this recessionary output gap if given enough time through high unemployment, pushing down wages, falling wages, causing the aggregate supply curve to move. That aggregate supply curve to move, returning us to our long run equilibrium. What about the other case? What about from the other side? What if we had an expansionary or an inflationary output gap route? Well, let's take a look at that next. Okay, so in this case here, we have found ourselves in an inflationary output gap. Inflationary output gap. That is such that our actual level of GDP, our actual output, is greater than our potential level of output, our potential GDP. The result of this, right? Okay, we're producing more stuff than we could at full employment. That must mean we're really needing a lot of people to do so. So hey, if we need all these extra people, that's pushing down our unemployment rate. So that means that our unemployment is less than our natural rate of unemployment. We're eating into that structural and that frictional unemployment. So, okay. We're in this kind of situation. We have our short run macroeconomic equilibrium where aggregate demand equals aggregate supply. What are the forces that are going to naturally cause this economy to return to its long run equilibrium? That is to cause output to return to potential. Well, okay, let's take a look at it. Again, the driving factor here is unemployment. So in this case, we have really, really low unemployment. That is from the firm's perspective, if you think about labor markets, it's really difficult to find a worker, right? And especially it's really difficult to find a good worker, a good quality worker who's already trained, already knows what they're doing and is productive and efficient, right? You're scraping the bottom of the barrel for a lot of your new hires. It's like, ah, uh, you're not really somebody I would normally hire. You don't really have the skills, mm, but I can make you do something in order to make me money. Right, so ah, these aren't really the people you want for the most part if it was a normal business environment. But given that everything's superheated, you'll, you'll take them because hey, they're better than nothing, they're breathing. But to get good talent, how do you actually get that good talent? Well, to get those good talent, to get those good workers, the workers that you actually really want, you need to attract them by increasing wages. By increasing wages, by beginning to offer to pay them more, well, by increasing wages, they're going to say, oh, hey, I'm only making $25 an hour, but that competitor, they're offering me $30 an hour if I go jump and work for them instead. Well, now the current boss is like, oh, man, either I lose you and I can't replace you, there's nobody else good out there, or I have to at least match that wage offer. Right? So in this case here, because labor is scarce, because labor is hard to come by, labor has the bargaining power, is able to push up their wage rate. Okay, as the wage rate rises, what does that mean? Well, that means that factor prices are similarly increasing. If factor prices are increasing, well, now the cost of production is increasing. And for a fixed price level, a firm's not able to produce as much as they once were, right? They're now having higher costs. So if they can't increase the price that they sell things at, they're just going to have to cut their production. So the result of this is wages and factor prices go up. Our aggregate supply begins to fall, begins to shift to the left. And similar idea, right? It's just going to be kind of creeping to the left, creeping to the left. Each of these cases, our new short run equilibrium is still in an inflationary output gap. So we still have this really, really low unemployment rate, this pushing up of wages. And as a result, our aggregate supply 
keep shifting leftward until, right, and once again, until, and again, I missed my mark. There we go. It'll continue to shift to the left until aggregate supply equals aggregate demand equals long run aggregate supply. That is, we have our long run equilibrium again. At this point, well, Y prime equals Y star. So that means unemployment equals natural rate of unemployment. There's no longer any wage pressure one way or another. So, hey, workers are happy. Firms are happy. There's no pressure to increase or decrease wages. And we get correspondingly a new price level. And we can say that's, I don't know, something like 107. So that is the result of this low unemployment, pushing up wages, higher wages, higher production costs, aggregate supply shifting to the left, output falls back to the potential and prices rise. That is increasing prices is inflationary. Thus, the natural response to an inflationary output gap is inflation and hence where it gets its name from. You will also hear or see this be referred to as an expansionary output gap from time to time, such that output has expanded beyond the potential level, but inflationary is the most common that you will hear. Okay, so we've witnessed both the natural adjustment process from a recessionary output gap. In the case of a recessionary output gap, unemployment's really high, as a result of the high unemployment, wages begin to fall. As wages fall, production increases. As production increases, we return to potential. Prices fall, output up. In the case of an inflationary or an expansionary output gap, we have the opposite case happening. We have really low unemployment. Low unemployment means an excess demand for labor. This excess demand for labor pushes up wages. Higher wages, higher factor prices mean higher costs of production, meaning that we can't produce as much, so output begins to fall. As output begins to fall, prices begin to rise, and we migrate our way back to our long-run equilibrium. So a big thing in either case is that it is the aggregate supply curve that is the natural responder to output gaps through the unemployment rate affecting wages, the aggregate supply shifts either to the left or to the right. Always through supply do we return to our long run equilibrium, at least through the natural process. We also have, and we kind of hinted at this already, we have what we would refer to as adjustment, adjustment asymmetry. And that is inflationary or expansionary output gaps. These tend to resolve themselves relatively quickly. You and I, well, as laborers, we're usually quite happy to accept a higher wage. Boss says, hey, I'm going to pay you more if you stay working for me. You're going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, cool. I, I'm, I'm good for that, right? Firms, if it comes to keeping productive employees that are earning them more than the wage they're paying them, well, they'd be happy to offer, not happy, but they will offer a higher wage more readily than losing the employee. So in this case here, in an inflationary or an expansionary output gap, we witness wages rising and thus aggregate supply shifting to the left. We witness this whole expansionary inflationary output gap closing relatively quickly, right? And that's a big word, relatively quickly. That is in relation to a recessionary output gap. In the case of a recessionary output gap, we have this phenomenon here, sticky wages, where, hey, we don't want to take a cut in our wages. Because we don't want to take a cut in our wages, we just rather you lay us off. We wouldn't actually, but our hope is always you'll lay the other guy off, not me, and I get to keep my high wage. Through this, sticky wages, this whole revision of wages downward, this whole shifting of our aggregate supply curve to the right, takes significantly longer. And that's what we're getting at with this adjustment asymmetry. 
is that expansionary inflationary output gaps, they tend to close relatively quickly. Recessionary output gaps, these can take significantly longer to close. And from social perspectives, this is a problem, right? From a social perspective, this is a problem because this is a potential long period of time of high rates of unemployment. And high rates of unemployment are problematic because these are people who are not working. These are people who are having a hard time paying their rent, paying their mortgage, getting food to eat, getting clothes to wear, paying for heat, right? All of this is problematic. This here is not good to have this high rate of unemployment. You want to get these people employed. You want to get these people paid so that, hey, they can live and they can contribute back to society. Also, from a government, from a political perspective, high rates of unemployment are unpopular. High rates of unemployment typically cause civil unrest. Um, high rates of unemployment have toppled governments. So governments are often interested in mitigating this, in controlling in these recessionary output gaps in order to help close these quicker. And let's take a look at what exactly the government can do through what we would call fiscal policy to assist in the closing of recessionary and truthfully also expansionary output gaps, right? They could, they could do this for expansionary as well. They typically don't. They typically like to ride the expansionary wave, but it could happen just the same. So fiscal policy, what do we mean by this? We mean the government's ability to set their expenditure and their rates of taxation. So this is the two tools which the current sitting government has at their disposal. They can decide how much they're going to expend and they can determine the rate at which they're going to tax people. So let's take a look at a scenario where we find ourselves in a recessionary output gap. So we have our axes always labeling our price level on the vertical, real output on the horizontal. We have downward sloping, no, oh, let's use our line tool to make that look nice. We have downward sloping our aggregate demand curve. We have upward sloping our aggregate supply curve. And again, this is our short run aggregate supply, but we'll just label it as aggregate supply. And I wanna draw this such that we are in a recessionary output gap. So I'm gonna put potential uh, maybe not quite that big of a recessionary output gap. Let's go and move my potential in a little. There we go. Something like that, such that that is my long run aggregate supply. That is my potential GDP right there. My short run macroeconomic equilibrium. Well, that's taking place with the white where the aggregate supply equals the aggregate demand. Y prime, and we'll say our price level is 100 to start off. So, okay, where are we? Y prime less than Y star. That is, unemployment is greater than the natural rate. This is our recessionary output gap, right? This is classic recessionary output gap. Okay, if the government just left it be, Right? If the government just let this be and did nothing, well, this high rate of unemployment would eventually push down wages. As wages get pushed down, aggregate supply would be able to increase, shift to the right, and we would make our way back to our long-run equilibrium, right? such that long-run aggregate supply would equal aggregate demand would equal aggregate supply. But... For one reason or another, the government's not willing to wait for this to happen. Maybe they're worried about the social effects. Maybe they're just a rather more humanitarian government and they're worried that, hey, people are going to starve to death. There's children whose parents are not working. How are these children getting the nutrients they need to grow and develop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's a lot of serious social effects that come with this. So government's interested in correcting this. Well, given the tools that the government has, their expenditure or their rate of taxation, they can influence our economic equilibrium, our short run macroeconomic equilibrium. And specifically what the government's goal is going to be is to 
increase short run macroeconomic equilibrium level of output. That's our Y prime here. They want to increase this such that they want to push Y prime towards Y star. If they could do it perfectly, yeah, they would want to increase our actual level of GDP all the way to potential. But uh, in reality, we never really know exactly where this is. We never really know exactly where that is. It's more of a guessing game. And so really what we're going to try to do is we just know, hey, we need to increase output in order to start to stimulate things and start to push things towards our potential. So yeah, that's reality. We're going to wave our hands and say governments have perfect, amazing information, and we can just do this. We can just push, boom, Y prime all the way to Y star. Okay, how do we do that? Well, if we take a look at our aggregate demand, it is through our demand shocks. It can be influenced through either our induced parts or our autonomous parts. The induced parts are our tax rate and our marginal propensity import. Our autonomous parts are autonomous consumption, investment, government expenditure, and exports. Hey, hey, look at that. Taxes, government expenditure, right there. Those are the two tools we have. So what can the government do then in order to assist this, in order to close this? Well, if we go back to kind of remembering what's going on here, as our tax rate falls, our marginal propensity to spend goes up, which means that real GDP would increase. So one way we could close this output gap is we could cut the tax rate. And keep in mind, the inverse of cutting the tax rate would be to increase payoffs, right? Payouts. So that would be like more employment insurance benefits, a larger social safety net. Uh, this would be things like we saw in the most recent pandemic, which was the introduction of the CERB payment. Um, the Canadian Employment Relief Benefit, I think, is what that one worked out to as an acronym, if I recall properly. Right? That there was just money that the government handed out to anybody who was negatively impacted employment-wise due to the pandemic. That's just a negative tax. That's the essence of decreasing this net tax rate. So, okay, that would have the effect of shifting aggregate demand to the right. Very similarly, what the government could do is they could boost their government expenditure by boosting their expenditure. So, hey, that's building more schools, building more hospitals, paving roads, building bridges, building hydroelectric dams, all of this government kind of big purchases, expenditure, infrastructure, and the like. All of this increasing autonomous expenditure. So, okay, as government expenditure goes up, that is autonomous expenditure goes up, which means again that real GDP will go up. So, again, they could engage in either one of those, or often in the case of a large recessionary output gap, they will engage in both of those. And both of these will have the effect of pushing our aggregate demand curve to the right. As it pushes our aggregate demand curve to the right, it pushes us towards our long run macroeconomic equilibrium. There we go, AD prime. And we have our new long run equilibrium such that we get a new higher price level in this case, 105, and back at Y prime equals. Y star. So through brute force, right, fiscal policy, you can think of it as a sledgehammer to hit the economy. It's not for fine tuning. It's to really knock the economy back in a direction. You can give it a good whack in one direction in that way there, pushing it up back towards its long run level that you would ideally want it to be. Okay. What's the difference in closing this recessionary output gap using fiscal policy versus the natural? Well, we witnessed using fiscal policy, we saw that prices rose, output rose, and hey, if we did this right, if we were able to enact this fast enough, none of this happened, right? 
None of this happened. Wages didn't fall. Aggregate supply didn't shift to the right. It was strictly government expenditure went up. Taxes went down. Aggregate demand went to the right to close this gap, right? That was the goal there. And that is, we don't witness this fall in wages. So, hey, that, that seems like a good thing as well. What about what happened through the natural though? Let's go back and take a look here. Well, through our natural process, unemployment, wages fell. As wages fell, aggregate supply shifted to the right, right? We said aggregate supply shifted to the right. Our end result was GDP increased, right? We wound up back at our long run equilibrium and prices fell. So big distinction if we wanted to compare and contrast, natural adjustment, prices fall because wages fall. Aggregate supply shifts for the natural. For our fiscal, prices rise, wages don't fall, aggregate demand shifts to the right. So bit of difference, bit of difference going on there. Okay, so fiscal policy. Well, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? What, what exactly is going on there? Well, uh, fiscal policy is a bit complicated. There's a lot to it as to whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing. But one of the problems with fiscal policy is that by increasing government expenditure, what you are doing is you are actually crowding out private expenditure. That is by the government spending more, right? Think about it. If we look at the market for goods and services, it's both the individual private firms and consumers trying to buy these goods as well as the government. If the government steps into this market more, that's increased demand in that market. That is by the government stepping into a marketplace, they begin to push up the price of those goods and services. If they're pushing up the price of those goods and services, a bunch of us, you and I are going, whoa, I don't know if I want to buy that anymore at the higher price. So the government stepping in, pushing up the price, ends up crowding out a lot of our private consumption. So that's that's problematic, right? And to see, take a look at an actual kind of example of this, let's let's take a look at a massive infrastructure project. So let's suppose the government's building a massive infrastructure project. Maybe they're building a giant new dam. Well, to build this giant new dam, the government needs a lot of concrete. So, okay, all of a sudden the government is in the market for a concrete and they're now a massive player. Well, before, let's say you could pour a patio in your backyard for, say, $1,000 worth of concrete. Now the government is buying up all the concrete for this dam Meaning that, hey, all of a sudden there's this excess demand for concrete. Prices begin to get pushed up as a result. Now, now you find that that same patio would cost you 5000 to produce. Well, okay. You were willing to pour a concrete patio, maybe hire a contractor to do it, create some work in that way. They're adding to GDP when it only cost you $1,000 to do it. When it costs you 5000 to build that same patio, now you're going, I, I don't know if that's a good deal. I don't know if I want to do that. You know what? I'm going to hold off. I'm not going to build my patio. That is by the government deciding to engage in this infrastructure project to build this dam. They have crowded out your contribution to GDP. That is your desire to build this patio. So kind of a you know, a brief example there as to how the crowding out effect works. A lot of the increase in government expenditure just replaces private consumption, private investment with public consumption and public investment. Many, many, many would argue that you and I, firms, know better what to consume, what to invest in due to profit incentives, due to utility maximization than the government does. The government tends to be a bit more inefficient, tends to make a few more mistakes than we do, than firms do in their consumption and investment decisions. So increased government expenditure crowds out private, potentially increases inefficiencies in the market as well.
So a potential problem there. What else do we have to say about fiscal policy? Well, there's another problem with it. The other problem with fiscal policy is that it suffers from what we will call legs. And there's two legs in specific which it suffers from. These two legs are known as execution uh, and decision legs. And I wrote those down backwards in the order they take place. So let's start off with decision legs. That's the first leg that is faced. So all of a sudden we have a problem. We find that we're in a recessionary output gap. Well, it takes time for the government to decide what to do, right? Here we go back to thinking about the COVID pandemic early 2020, right? We knew this was hitting us. We knew that output was falling. We knew people were losing their jobs. We knew we were in a recessionary output gap. Just the same, the government couldn't instantly go and pass relief. It had to be debated in the House of Commons. It had to be figured out, ooh, do we do something? Is this going to be long lasting or is this going to be just a short thing and people will be back at work before they know it? If people are back at work before they know it, we don't need to do anything. That's fine. Just let the economy sort itself out. If this is long lasting, yeah, yeah, we, we, we should get involved. So, okay, there is some debate about that. Then they decide, okay, we need to act. Okay, if we need to act, what, what do we do? Do we cut taxes? Do we increase government expenditure? Do we do both? How much of do we do of each? Who do we cut taxes for? Who do we give money to? What are the criteria for that? How do we distribute this? If we spend money, what do we spend money on? What do we build? What do we throw this money at? Which constituents, right, are we giving this money to, right? Is there a big facility somewhere in Quebec that we really want to win the next election in? Maybe we give them a bunch of money for projects so that they're like, well, this government's great. We're going to vote for them again, right? There's a lot of politics going on in this. This is all this decision like this is time that takes place. During all of this deciding, people are unemployed. People are looking for food. People are looking for money. People are worried about where they're going to pay, how they're going to pay rent, how they're going to pay their mortgage. Okay, then they've decided. They know exactly what they're going to do. They put it into place. We still have our execution leg. Now, for fiscal policy involving taxes, the execution leg is relatively short. The government can quickly deposit, relatively quickly, deposit money into your account as a subsidy. The government can relatively quickly cut taxes on a lot of businesses. Businesses file taxes usually quarterly. They can update that and the business can save a bunch on taxes. Uh, they change our sales taxes. That can take place, again, relatively fast. So the execution of change in tax policy, uh, that's relatively quick. Execution on increasing government expenditure, that takes a bit more time. Let's say the government does decide to engage in this big infrastructure project building a dam. Well, most of the cost of a lot of these infrastructure projects are, of course, labor costs, right? Your cost of the workers. Well, say we've approved this to be something like a $5 million infrastructure project. That actually be pretty cheap. Uh, but say it was a $5 million infrastructure project. Well, they're not just going to dish out the entire $3 million to the workers right on day one. Here you go. Here's your paycheck for the next year. Year's worth of income right up front. There you go. No, 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 right? This, this is going to trickle in bi-weekly every paycheck. So a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, a little bit there. Same for all the rest, right? That other two million worth of materials, equipment, all of that. You're not going to buy all the equipment. You're not going to buy all the materials you need for this project on day one. You're going to buy what you need on day one, on day one. Then as you progress through the project, you're going to buy the other stuff, the other stuff, the other stuff. So that is as you transition through this project, if building this infrastructure project is a three-year ordeal, well, this $5 million is trickling into the economy over a three-year period. So that is, this aggregate demand isn't going boom all the way to the right. It's creeping to the right. 
And that's potentially a problem. That potentially is going to create issues for our adjustment. And let's, let's talk about why, why that might be an issue. Let's go back up and take a look at this graph. Cleaning it up a bit. So let's say, like we were just saying there, that we have this leg. And because we have this leg, government implements government implements fiscal policy. Let's just clean this guy up a bit here. Okay. Government implements fiscal policy. They cut taxes. Some of the money from government expenditure has hit the economy. And the result is our aggregate demand curve has shifted. Aggregate demand curve has shifted. And we find that we are now here. So, okay, there we are. But keep in mind that this blue value of Y prime, we're still in a recessionary output gap. That is, we're still in this recessionary output gap. Unemployment is still greater than the natural rate which means, right, the natural forces of the economy are not like, oh, hey, government, I think you're going to engage in fiscal policy. I know you're talking about it. We're just going to hold off with our whole downward pressure on wages thing until you figure out what's happening. We're just going to hold off laying people off until you decide if you're going to do something. No, 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 right? These natural forces of the economy, these are just a whole bunch of autonomous individuals, firms, companies all over the place making decisions that are best for them. And they're looking at it and they're going, wow, output is down. We don't need all these people. Our profits are down. We need to lay people off. So unemployment goes up. Unemployment goes up. We have this natural downward pressure on wages given all this excess supply of workers. This is all happening. This is all happening as the government faces their decision and execution legs. Then this aggregate demand begins its slow creep to the right with the hope, with the hope that eventually it gets to our new place, right? Right to our new long run equilibrium. Problem is this whole time the aggregate demand curve is creeping to the right, we're in a recessionary output gap. We are having downward pressure on wages. That is, all of this downward pressure on wages, if it gets to enact itself, this downward pressure on wages will cause aggregate supply begin to creep to the right. As this aggregate supply curve begins to creep to the right, we thought through our fiscal policy, that we were going to end up right there at the gold equilibrium. But instead, instead aggregate supply has reacted to our recessionary output gap and aggregate supply has begun to move as well. And aggregate supply begins to move as well, responding to this recessionary output gap along the way. And the result of that is that we end up, uh, let's use, I'm running out of colors here. Let's use white to make this guy pop. We instead end up at some, some, I'm just picking a point at random here, some new short run equilibrium that's actually way beyond our potential output. And that is because we were engaging in this fiscal policy, we have these legs. While we were engaging this, the natural process is always happening. It's natural, right? We can't shut it off. It's just the way the economy responds to these output gaps. Because both were happening together, there's the risk, right? And this is it. This isn't always going to happen, but there's the risk that we could end up at this white equilibrium. That is, we could have pushed ourselves into an expansionary or an inflationary output gap. That is, due to these legs being too long, due to everything with that, we could have overshot our target. And now, why, why is this a bad thing? Well, by overshooting our target, this is potentially a bad thing because in the process, we've been crowding out private expenditure. So we've been inefficiently allocating our resources. So, okay, that's not good. We've now overshot. So that is we've spent way too much public money. So, okay, now we've really inefficiently allocated a lot of resources. And now we find ourselves into a superheated case. 
In the superheated case, we now have to deal with even more increasing prices. We already witnessed increasing prices due to this crowding out. We're going to witness even more increasing prices due to our natural return back to equilibrium. And so we get massive amounts of inflation, huge increases in prices, and wages, wages had a little bit of falling. So right, lots of things happening there. Lots of just uncertainty, a lot of increasing inefficiencies in the market, not an ideal situation. So how should we respond to these negative, these recessionary output gaps, right? I kind of just kind of made a big case that fiscal policy is bad. Well, okay, no, no, fiscal policy is not necessarily bad. The big thing to keep in mind, right, like I said, fiscal policy is not to fine tune the economy. It's to be that sledgehammer to knock it back in the direction you want. You want to engage in fiscal policy to push aggregate demand in the direction you want it in, in order to lessen the impacts of a recessionary output gap. Very rarely is it to actually completely close a recessionary output gap. Ideally, you implement fiscal policy. You watch the aggregate demand curve begin to shift back towards the long run. As you approach it, as wages begin to fall, as the aggregate supply begins to move as well, you begin to scale back your government expenditure. You begin to increase your taxes to begin to push a lot of that burden on recovery back onto the private sector and off the public sector. By doing so, you can overcome a lot of these problems with fiscal policy, but it requires a bit more of a hands-on approach. It requires a lot more analysis, which is, of course, then more cost to the government as well. So not, nothing's ever simple in that case. But to simplify what we've looked at so far, what we've taken a look at, to wrap us up, to summarize, we have taken a look at our adjustment to long run equilibrium. We took a look at our natural adjustment process which is fueled by unemployment. That unemployment ends up affecting our wages. That's a funny W, let's draw that again. Unemployment ends up affecting our wages. Our wages end up affecting our factor prices, which influence our aggregate supply curve. So that was our natural adjustment process. We also took a look at how the government can use fiscal policy in order to influence the economy. And we only took a look at a recessionary, res um, how they could impact a recessionary output gap. They could do the opposite for an expansionary if they wanted to, right? If they wanted to. What the government can do is they can influence either their government expenditure and or their rate of taxation. This here is gonna affect our planned aggregate expenditure for a fixed price level which will then end up influencing our aggregate demand curve. Keep in mind, government expenditure, that affects autonomous expenditure. Government tax rate, that affects our marginal propensity to spend, and thus it affects our multiplier. So how that guy works through there. That's the summary of what we've done so far. We've taken a look at how we can naturally return, how government can get involved to use fiscal policy to return. We talked about some of the problems with fiscal policy that is crowding out. And we also talked about the legs and the potential problems that arise with the legs. That is not to say fiscal policy is all bad, right? The reason why we want to use fiscal policy is to alleviate this unemployment, to alleviate this falling wages, because those have real social consequences, real social effects as people are out of work. So fiscal policy is a mercy, if you will, to help people who are hurting in those times. That is not to say it's without cost though, right? Everything is a cost benefit trade-off. It has a cost to get a benefit. Ah, is it worth it in this scenario? Is it not? Really a case by case basis as to what is, what is not appropriate. Going forward, this more or less covers us off for this part of it. Going forward in the next 
Oh, there's going to be some videos going through, okay, some examples and the like. But once we get back to new content, our next set of videos is going to be working up towards monetary policy being another tool that governments have through central banks to influence output gaps, to close expansionary, to close recessionary output gaps, and to bring us closer to full employment or bring us closer to potential GDP. So this is what we'll be building up to next by taking a look at money, banking, central banks, and their ability to enact monetary policy. If you have any questions, though, on anything that we have covered so far, so fiscal policy, natural adjustment process, our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can feel free to either comment below, post on the D2L frequently asked questions, or, of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks. Until next time.